For our speaker today, Dr. Carol Evans, the director of the Strategic Studies Institute and the United States Army War College Press. The Strategic Studies Institute is the research arm of the Army War College and serves as the Army's premier institute for global geostrategic and national security research and analysis. The Army War College Press publishes high quality, timely, and impactful studies of key national security issues, military strategy, theater operations, and on other topics related to the nature of land warfare and the Army's future. Dr. Evans began her career in academia in the field of international political economy and has held a variety of faculty and research positions, including positions at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, the University of California, Berkeley, Harvard University, Washington University in St. Louis, and the Brookings Institute. She holds a Master of Science degree and a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the London School of Economics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carol Evans. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, it's been two years, I think. The last time some of the faces I see in the room are familiar from my last talk, I think it was in 2019 on the Red Sea. Um, I continue to expand and look at the globe, and I think an area that is of tremendous interest is exactly the type of uh, emerging alliance called the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. And I'm going to call it the Quad for short. That is how it's often referred to. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a short overview of what is the Quad. Um, it's, it's been recently established, so there's not a long history to it. Um, and I'm going to then talk a little bit about, well, what are the geostrategic factors that are encouraging the emergence of this quadrilateral dialogue among four very important strategic partners for the United States? The long and short of that is called China. So we'll spend a little bit of time understanding what is it about China in the Indo-Pacific is driving this emerging alliance. And then what I want to do is take a step back and talk a little bit about how the Quad is perceived by each of its four partners, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. They have different contending views of its utility, and so I think it's useful for you to understand what is happening in their geostrategic environments that's motivating them to participate in the Quad, but they might have some constraints in terms of realizing its full potential. So it's a very complicated alliance, um, and it's good to have that perspective from each of the Quad partners as it evolves even further. And then, of course, we must, we must consider China. How does it view the Quad? Is it a, an incredible emerging threat, or is it something to be dismissed because it doesn't see the long-term utility or its ability to sustain itself over time? And then I'm just going to leave you with a few questions or issues that the Quad will continue to face as it uh, grows and evolves over time. With that, I understand we're going to have a short break, and then we're going to come back for some questions and answers. So what is the Quad? And I apologize if some of this is busy on the slide um, or a little bit too, too small of a font to see. But we have to begin with the Quad's emergence in 2004 um, with the huge tsunami that affected the Indo-Pacific. And the Quad countries came together during that time to provide humanitarian and disaster relief following that tsunami. And this was a really important uh, instigator event for the Quad's emergence later, and more formally, uh, as they called themselves, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue in 2007. Much of the initial discussion following the tsunami was looking at maritime security. If you think about Japan, United States, Australia, and India, they're all important maritime uh, countries, and they all rely on that maritime for their security and for their trade. But there are also four very important democracies, India being incredible for the United States, right? The world's largest democracy. So there was a recognition that among democratic countries, to talk and discuss about some of the foundational uh, issues that face them as countries was a really um, important dialogue to, to begin. And this was uh, commenced in 2007. And it was called Quad 
And the main proponent for the Quad during this very initial uh, stage was actually Japan, and in particular, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And he was very concerned, particularly about North Korea and China at the time, and the need for what he called a free and open Indo-Pacific. Open by meaning enable the sea lines of communication, all of your trade routes, your energy routes, your digital communications that pass through the Indo-Pacific, ensure that they remained um, open and from uh, without contention, and free in the sense of countering China's more authoritarian increasing presence in the Indo-Pacific. So China was really important in driving that free and Indo-Pacific that you will hear continuously through many different policy documents among all of the Quad countries and including the United States. It had a very short-lived existence. It sort of died a, a sudden death in 2008. Two important events to discuss. The first was enormous pressure exerted by China on Australia. Most of Australia's imports, whether you're talking about coal or white wine or red wine, minerals, um, go, to uh, go to China. It has a huge trade dependence on China, and China was able to use some of its coercion to um, bring Australia out of that alliance by just using the threat of trade restrictions and sanctions against Australia. So Australia withdraws, and then we have the uh, resignation of Prime Minister Abe, and uncertainty within Japanese uh, domestic politics in terms of the next prime minister and whether traditionally a he would um, follow through with the Quad. So we had, if you like, an intermission for quite some time. Now during that time period, it's really important to recognize that the Obama administration was the one that did the pivot to the Indo-Pacific, the pivot to Asia. We were beginning to downsize, you know, talking about strategic withdrawal from Afghanistan and Iraq, and a recognition that was particularly with increased Chinese activities in the Indo-Pacific, that we needed to reorient our national security and our defense posture to look more closely at the Pacific. And as part of that pivot, we see some of the Quad countries, particularly Australia and India and Japan, taking part in bilateral exercises. So while the Quad is mothballed, mothballed, there's still quite a bit of bilateral and trilateral activity occurring in the form of military exercises. I would point to you the Malabar exercise, which is, was a trilateral ex Navy maritime exercise uh, between the United States, uh, Japan, and Australia. Talisman Sabre is an exercise between the US and Australia. Um, Yura Abbas is a uh, army to army exercise between the Indian and US armies. Tiger Triumph was held two years ago, and it's going to be held shortly, um, with US Marines amphibious and a joint exercise across the Indian military. And then Annual X is, um, is Japan and US. So despite the, the uh, quad going into recession, there is nonetheless quite a bit of activity. We see tremendous resurgence beginning in 2017. A lot of impetus, and we'll talk very shortly, but it's all due to China. And uh, very frequent meetings, and particularly at the foreign ministerial level, at least eight different meetings um, occurring across uh, some of the countries within Southeast and South Asia. In 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic, the Quad meets um, virtually, all of these were virtual meetings in, in 2020, to discuss enlarging the Quad's mission from more of a, a loose security pact, but uh, discussing more the importance of supply chain dependencies. And in particular, the need to counter China's COVAX vaccine program. Um, and being able to use India's tremendous vaccine production capabilities to provide uh, an alternative to China in, in the vaccine domain. So we see other areas too where there was an expansion looking at climate change um, and uh, other types of supply chain dependencies, particularly to do with semiconductors, um, as so much semiconductor production was taking place in China. So expansion in scope, but also an expansion in countries. So uh, New Zealand, for example, South Korea, and Vietnam were also um, asked to take part in some sidebar organizations. 
the Quad is still the Quad. There's no, it's not been a formal expansion to include these countries, but um, there is impetus to perhaps expand its scope and its membership. Another important uh, event during this time period is that Australia rejoins the Malabar exercise um, in, in 2020 after 13 years not um, participating. So this was a very demonstrative signal on the part of Australia uh, to show its commitment back into the Quad. I think one of the readings that you had for today's discussion was an article by then Prime, well, Prime Minister Rudd. And he, in fact, was the one that brought Australia out of the Quad. So I found it very interesting reading his article and adjusting history a little bit to reflect um, his decisions at the time. Today, we've had, in 2021, um, with the Biden administration coming in, a significant movement again. There's been a, a, a very uh, important view that the Quad is important, particularly with our relationship with India. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. But uh, the Biden administration has, in fact, the very first in-person senior leader meeting. It's the very first time the Quad leaders met, and they met at the White House, and there you have that lovely picture in September. And we've continued with further meetings of the Quad at the foreign ministerial level um, throughout this year. Additionally, the Biden administration just released last month its Indo-Pacific strategy, and the Quad is at the core of that strategy. So short history of the Quad, but now let's shift to why has the Quad, what, what's galvanized this new impetus? And of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's China really at the center of this. Um, so I'll just, you know, you can read that, but how, we, how is the Quad then uh, being motivated? And I want to start then by giving you a little bit of an introduction if you're not familiar with the Indo-Pacific. Why is the Indo-Pacific so strategic and why is the Quad um, so important to sustaining that free and openness that we've been discussing. Uh, it is strategic because it really has the world's largest and most vital sea lines of communication. And so here you can see all of the energy routes um, and some of the most important hubs of, and choke points in the world. And these choke points are gonna be really important. They're very important for China because China, when it brings its oil, it has to pass through these very important straits called the Malacca Straits. There are also some further straits that I'll discuss as well, the Sunda and Lombok Straits. But that whole area is what China calls its Malacca Dilemma. It has to pass through those straits in order to bring its oil, energy resources, and trade resources in, in either direction, even up through the Suez Canal into Europe. And it's always concerned that the United States Navy in particular and its allies could blockade this region, use its submarine forces, naval forces, to take out its merchant and naval forces. So this is a really key area um, for the Chinese where it sees a strategic weakness. But it's also vital to all of the trade and, and production across the Indo-Pacific. We also talk about um, the fact that this is an area ripe with, you know, insurgencies, wars. China has fought uh, India. Um, we have the Pakistani-India confrontation. A lot happening within the region. But its economic importance, we see such a shift um, of production now moving from Europe into this Asia area. So everyone wanting to get a bit of a commercial foothold and hence tremendous competition. The most important factor driving the Quad really is the rise of Chinese hegemony in the region. And we can see this obviously with the reintegration of Hong Kong and China's affirmed commitment to bring Taiwan back into its fold. There have been tremendous uh, pressure on uh, territorial claims by China across a whole series of islands in the South China Sea and in the uh, East China Sea. The Sunkakus are uh, Japanese uh, territory, but we see tremendous um, island building in the Pratas, the Paracels, Fratlies, all of those islands in the South China Sea. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, why that's very important for ourselves and, and the Quad. I mentioned uh, border military clashes, but China's undergone tremendous military modernization, and it has used that military modernization to project power 
across the Indo-Pacific. At one time, China was much more focused, at least in its own territorial waters, what it considers its first island chain. But we see a tremendous expansion across into the Indian Ocean, all the way up into the Suez Canal. And then we also are witnessing China using its tremendous economic investment trade capacity through the Belt and Road Initiative to expand its presence all the way into Europe to the degree um, that a lot of the important uh, port operations across the globe that are dependent on trade, two-thirds of port operations now globally are either controlled by the Chinese or they are um, having some type of operational capacity. So that's really important to note um, as we go forward. So let's talk about the South China Sea militarization. So here I've given you some uh, quick snapshots of some of the island building efforts that have been occurring. This is the contested area. This is what I've told you is that that nine dash line, this is the first island chain that China maintains is its own uh, strategic territory. But it's also, as you can see, it is hugely contested from everyone from Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, and Vietnam having claims within this area. The Japanese have been sorry, the Chinese have been steadily militarizing those islands. And these are some examples where you can see runways being built, the development of um, missile launching capabilities for what we call anti-access, anti-denial operations. So the whole point of this area and building up these islands with this type of capability is to deny American naval access into this uh, area and to provide that first layer of defense. But what we're now finding is they are uh, expanding, particularly through hypersonic and a lot of their ballistic uh, missile capabilities, looking even further into the Pacific and elsewhere to this, what they call the second island chain, which would then is made basically Guam, our major naval base in the Pacific, is now completely vulnerable to Chinese uh, missiles. Part of that modernization we have to consider is some vital areas. Shipbuilding, as I mentioned, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. There's Chinese have made tremendous investments in hypersonic weapons and in integrated air defense systems. Of great concern for our Navy is that China is now larger than, China's Navy is now larger than ourselves. Um, and not only is that due because of the tremendous emphasis on expanding its carrier, aircraft carrier capability, but it's also important because China's shipbuilding um, capability also way outdwarfs ours. We have really gone into such a decline in our domestic capability there. And many of the ships that are built for merchant capabilities are, mil are built to military specifications and uh, can be called upon the Chinese uh, government in a time of war or conflict. So while we might just consider the size of China's navy in terms of its uh, forces, we actually have to think about it in a much larger context. This is the most worrying concern for ourselves right now, is I mentioned the tremendous outgrowth of the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, the PLAF. Um, tremendous advancements have been made in what we call ground launch, and uh, ballistic missiles and ground-launched cruise missiles. So we're talking about ranges of you know, 5,000, like 2,000 miles, 2,500 miles or more. And we also have the development of what we call intermediate range ballistic missiles um, that are capable of when our ships, Navy, US Navy ships are transiting through those South China seas would be in danger of their missiles. And that, that's why they're called killer carrier missiles. Our carriers are vulnerable. And then China has also um, developed hypersonic missiles that they can then launch from a number of their bombers that are situated in those contested islands. And those, uh, these are the different rings. And will we be able to have this presentation made available, Mike? Can we have this presentation made available? Because it's hard for them to see. But you can then look at the different rings and the radius of where those missiles are capable of hitting but a huge capability. And as I said, when we talk about the United States, um, we are far, far, far behind uh, Chinese capability. 
So the vulnerability is there and ever present. So what about, as I mentioned, the expansion of China into the Indo-Pacific? So here we're concentrated uh, on the Pacific side. And as I mentioned, these are the key straits that we're concerned about. Uh, Chinese Rear Admiral uh, Zhao has called for the development of, a of two separate carrier battle groups. One that will be based in the Western Pacific and another that will be based in the Indian Ocean. And these, both carrier battle groups are going to be there to protect those important sea lines of communication. And they are certainly going to um, eclipse what our, our, right now our naval projection build is capable of meeting. Beginning in 2008, um, the PRC, the People's Liberation Army Navy, the plan, has deployed into the Indian Ocean on regular uh, bases. A lot uh, to counter the piracy efforts that were coming out of the Horn of Africa, particularly from Somalia, where some of the merchant shipping were being contested. Um, and also, again, just for simple protection of their sea lines of communication. What was most, most worrying, particularly for US uh, uh, naval intelligence, was the deployment of their fast attack sub submarines beginning in 2013, with regular uh, visits, particularly to um, Pakistan, uh, and also into Sri Lanka, right near and adjacent to India, sending a very strong signaling countervailing uh, measures to the Indians. Uh, and in 2017, we see uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy, along with a contingent of their Marines, set up their first naval over overseas base in Djibouti. There's another one in the works further up the Horn of Africa into the Sudan. I talked about also how the PRC is being able to exploit its trade, its production, and other capabilities through its Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI. This is a signature uh, program from Xi Jinping himself, focused on the development of overseas infrastructure to support Chinese economic interests. There are actually two. Um, there's a belt and there's a road. The road is overseas and it starts really in China's western regions and it's meant to connect China to Europe through a series of roadways, um, high-speed trains, digital communications. There's a so-called peace cable that it right now is coming through um, Pakistan up the Suez Canal and going to be ending in Marseille in France, for example. Um, carrying a huge amount of traffic. Then there's also the, this blue here is the belt, and it is the maritime Silk Road. And this is one that's most concerning as we talk about the Indo-Pacific for our quad partners. These two are meant to extend uh, China's influence, and as I said, the, the maritime one is a particular concern because of the development of ports along that route to support Chinese um, both military and economic interests. And in fact, we call this the string of pearls. And so what uh, China has strategically done over the past decade is to develop either port agreements or through its Belt and Road initiatives, actually build these particular ports to support both their economic, trade, naval interests. And what's of concern, especially for a country like India, we now have two ports in Sri Lanka, in Colombo and in Hambantota. There's one underdeveloped now in the Maldives. Um, we have uh, in Myanmar, and we have, as we'll see right here, both in Gwadar, which is going to be a very strategic one, just adjacent to India, very deep water, looking at major um, PRC naval assets. Uh, and then all the way, as I said, Djibouti into Sudan. So the string of pearls, very, very strategic and um, something that the, uh, we, the United States, are having to try and compete with. So hopefully I've given you a bit of an overview of the emerging China, its rise in hegemonic aspirations, coupled with its both economic and military tools in order to enhance its presence in the Indo-Pacific. That is essentially what is driving a lot of the Quad. So now we're going to shift gears, and I want to talk a little bit then about 
flawed cooperation from the view of its members. And we're going to start with Japan because, as I said, Japan was the proponent, the original proponent of uh, the, the Quad and has been a consistent uh, member uh, asking to further goals, including um, aside from just its military focus. So some of the security issues that uh, Japan is faced with is the first concern is really the US-China relationship. Um, and how does that factor in? It is worried. It's seeing that the numbers, particularly for Chinese versus US naval assets, are not in the favor of the United States. And with that, becomes, it enables that to be, uh, make Japan even more vulnerable. It's also very concerned about a possible Chinese takeover of Taiwan because it feels if Taiwan falls, it is next on the chopping block. There's been increased Chinese activity, we call it gray zone activity, in its territorial waters, particularly around the Senkaku Islands. Um, and it's had numerous uh, violations of its airspace. This picture here is uh, two uh, uh, Japanese uh, Coast Guard uh, vessels actually ramming a Chinese fishing vessel off the Senkakus. So um, they've been going at it you know, head on for quite some time. But Japan being an island country, it's enormously reliant on its sea lines of communication. So, and that was one of the reasons, you know, if you think back to World War II and Chinese, uh, Japanese entry into that war, its vulnerability towards its energy, its oil imports, its import exports, everything has to come through um, the sea. So it too sees that uh, the PLA and its expansion into those sea lines of communication with its naval assets might be uh, jeopardizing its uh, own sea lines. If we're thinking about what the Quad brings to Japan, I think it's important that the Quad fits into the US-led alliance. Um, Japan has relied pretty much completely on the United States for its security arrangements. And it sees uh, the Quad as a really important hedging mechanism if the United States is not able to sustain itself as well in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the Quad, particularly India and Australia, are going to bring some additional capabilities. And Japan has also always emphasized the need among its ASEAN partners to think about the importance of humanitarian disaster relief, particularly because the area is so conflicted by climate change and uh, other types of increasing tsunamis and, uh, and storms. So the ability to provide the quad and uh, give that type of assistance is another area that it is very interested in maintaining. Many of you know that Japan is basically has been a pacifist country. You know That's why it's had to rely on the United States for its security. And it has uh, constitutional constraints that does not allow it to be more expeditionary with its own naval assets. And so the Quad, again, the capabilities through exercises like Malabar, or bilateral exercises with India and with Australia, give it a cover, if you like, to be more present uh, in the Pacific. Shifting to India. India, to me, is the linchpin of the Quad. And I would argue that where India goes, the Quad will go. Um, India has been a it's, it's a very complex country. Um, it started its foreign policy from a perspective of non-alignment during the early uh, 1960s, 1970s. It, it was just becoming out of independence, and it really did not want to align either with uh, the United States or with Russia or then the Soviet Union. So it, decided, it, it campaigned on, across uh, non-alignment. And then it shifted to what they called strategic autonomy. It wanted to be able to build up its own defense capacities, its own economic capacities, but still heavily reliant um, on its former friend and partner, Russia. And now we look today that uh, India has taken a much more um, ambitious foreign policy where it wants to be multi-aligned. For Russia, yes, it sees itself still as a friend and important for its arms supplies. But there's been a growing, very strong relationship beginning with the Obama administration, continuing into the Trump administration, and continuing with Biden, of the importance of the US relationship. And that's really where India sees its future going. 
But there are a lot of bureaucratic constraints and domestic policy constraints within India that are preventing some of that. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The number one issue is what India perceives as Russia's encir sorry, China's encirclement of India. And from the maritime, with the expansion of its Chinese nuclear submarine capacities along its borders, as well as its port operations in countries right adjacent to it, but also over land, where the conflicts have occurred between India and China have been on the borders. But this important corridor that China is building with Pakistan under the Belt and Road is called CPAC. And it is building a whole set of road networks and pipelines. The goal for China is to bring, rather than go through the Malacca Straits, but to bring it here into Gwadar with overseas capacity, overseas and land capacity, to bring that oil into China, thereby avoiding the Malacca Straits. But that Gwadar base is a very important deep water port that China sees it will use um, for some of its uh, deployments. And also as well as Colombo, where it regularly um, docks some of its nuclear attack submarines. This is right, as I said, adjacent to India. And China is pouring a tremendous amount of money into Pakistan to build up its naval capacity as well. So India feels um, very much threatened. Uh, and because of the increasing presence in the Indian Ocean, um, this is of concern because India views that as its own backyard. During the recent border clash along the sea lines, sorry, the um, line of actual control it, about a year ago, um, where you had both casualties, uh, Indian and Chinese casualties along that border, the PRC initiated a series of cyber attacks on India's infrastructure while those negotiations were ongoing and uh, basically took out Mumbai's hospitals um, for a period of nearly a week. So uh, China's exerting itself in some ways that make India um, increasingly interested in having a further alliance with the Quad. Australia, as we mentioned, rejoined in, uh, recently. And so having Australia in its mix um, being a more uh, easy partner to, because of a lot of their increased trade relationships has been another encouraging factor. What are some of the advantages, then, of the Quad for India? Um, one of the things, I think, is the Quad, by its stature, is bringing India's reputation up as a true international power, one to be reckoned with, rather than remaining as a, as a smaller middle power, despite its huge size and capacity. Um, I think the other important aspect of the Quad is that India has relied for about 60% of its military uh, platforms come from Russia. Problematic, you know, not only because of a source of dependence, but they're not necessarily on par with US and European systems. And so being able to diversify through the Quad with the US, with um, Japan, with Australia, uh, their technologies is a really important motivating factor for the Quad. Another aspect about India and the Quad is the other countries, both Australia, um, Japan, and the United States, we work very, fairly effectively in a joint environment. So when we're talking about joint operations, we're talking about integrated operations between our Navy, uh, Marine Corps, and Army. India does not have, they don't understand, they don't have, there's no J yet in joint. Their services are very siloed and are often competing for resources. And they, when they exercise with the United States and they look at the capability of joint operations, this is something that they're really driving to. And so looking at our ways of deploying forces, the technology that supports that type of interoperability between our forces has had a huge impact on India. And so they see huge utility then in working with the United States through those exercises and through the Quad to be in receipt of that type of technology. So in the lower picture here, these are Poseidon aircraft. On one side we have India, on the other side we have the United States. These are built by Boeing. They are a prodigious maritime domain awareness MDA platform. Forgive all my acronyms. Um, but they do a tremendous amount of intelligence gathering. They're able to uh, track uh, naval craft, any type of craft in the water. They're able to track uh, and locate um, submarines, and they have various other capabilities that I can't talk about here. 
but a prodigious platform. And so India sent a whole contingent to the United States to get training on that uh, platform, and they regularly interchange them out um, and do joint exercises together. So it's a great example of how that quad interrelationship interchangeability is, is helping. And for India, too, it recognizes its dependency, particularly on its supply chains uh, coming from China. Uh, China has been a big trading partner for India. So again, helping build those other relationships with Japan and with Australia to diversify that economic base is another advantage. Let's flip the coin. You know, what's the benefit of the Quad for India? Obviously, India has uh, the world's largest army. So it's a force multiplier. And it's developing its uh, maritime capabilities very nicely as well when I mentioned Poseidon. Um, but I think one of its foremost attributes is its geostrategic uh, location. These are what we call the Andaman and Nicobar, Nicobar Islands. They are located way down here. Here's mainland India. And guess where they're located? Right along the Straits of Malacca. These are underdeveloped uh, bases. There is a tri-service command that has just been stood up in the last five years at Port Blair. But the United States and India have signed an agreement called LAMOA. It's a joint logistics um, cooperation agreement and four other agreements that allow for intelligence sharing and for basing. So there, stay tuned. I think this is going to be an area where we'll see increased investment in India's capacity to have um, US ships, UK ships, other types of ships, naval assets coming in here in order to do that sea lines of communication monitoring and multi-domain um, operations in this region so that we have a better understanding of the movement of Chinese naval assets and submarines um, through these straits. The other asset that uh, India brings is that it's a very strong regional uh, power. It, has, it, it engages a lot through diplomacy, through economic assistance, even military assistance to other Asian countries in the region. Um, just last month, it provided a intermediate range missile. It's a sea strike uh, missile for the Philippines. So it's an anti-ship missile. Um, and again, this is uh, by India being able to provide this technology, use its good neighbor relationships with other countries, it enables our partnering capacity as well. We can ride along what India is doing. Now, how does India view the Quad? It is having to do that very careful balancing between its partner, Russia, and its foe, China. It doesn't want to be seen, the Quad doesn't want to be seen from the Indian's perspective as anti-China. So it's been playing a very careful balancing act. And the most important thing there is um, two, as I said, domestic political constraints. Um, India has had very strong socialist power, uh, parties, strong communist parties in some of its states. And there's uh, Prime Minister Modi, as much as he's been an advocate for the US relationship, he is cognizant uh, by the right, more right-wing part of his parties of not getting too far out in front of that relationship. Particularly with the sudden withdrawal from Afghanistan, there's, it, it sort of spurred this lingering suspicion, can the US be a dependable partner? And that goes back again to our sustainment of Pakistan during our war with Afghanistan. So complex you know, set of constraints there. India has been proposing through the Quad that to enlarge it with other partners and to enlarge, you know, don't simply con uh, concentrate it on its defense aspects. Bring in the COVID, bring in climate change, bring in other areas where we can um, cooperate more fully. Australia. I think Australia is a fascinating country. Um, we don't spend a lot of time, I think, in the United States, except for maybe thinking about the great red wine at exports. Um, but it's the junior member of the Quad, you know, partly because of its in-again, out-again relationship. But it has been probably the most subjective and the most vulnerable to Chinese economic and political coercion. So just recently, uh, with the resurgence, China has uh, embarked on some pretty brutal uh, trade uh, sanctions and trade restrictions. 
um, on many, about 70% of Australia's exports. So they've had to really quickly figure out other types of trade routes for some of those products. Um, it has, China's also launched a massive political influence campaign inside Australia itself, buying off academics, journalists, and state politicians. So there's been a huge concern of its vulnerability. Um, and we're talking about you know, real money and influence versus the disinformation or the kind of more espionage campaigns that uh, China has done here in the United States. Obviously recognizing a clear military threat and a growing one in its backyard. But it's also worried about not so much commitment about the United States, but our ability to sustain ourselves. And I think that's an open question, particularly when we're now looking at Ukraine. You know, we, we're, where, is, where is going to be the balance of our capabilities that Europe, we're supposed to pivot to the, to the Pacific, how are we going to do both? So Australia is recognizing it has to step up to the plate more, but it can also do that through the Quad. So benefit of the Quad to Australia obviously means to manage that economic pressure. And they've been expanding huge trade relations, obviously, with other Quad partners, particularly with India, particularly with Japan. Um, and I've already talked about you know, the possible uh, regional retren retrenchment. But we've seen a much more proactive uh, part of Australia now, strengthening its defense ties to both, uh, and economic ties to both India and Japan. Australia also brings an incredible capability to the Quad because of its geographic location. We call it, you know, down under and top over because of the way uh, where Australia lies within the Indo-Pacific. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit because we'll talk about uh, future basing, possibly, that Australia can provide. But it's also a member of the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. Um, the Five Eyes, if you're not familiar, is an intelligence alliance that was set up just after World War II between the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And um, it is, Australia itself is an important contributor because it has satellite tracking capabilities um, in Australia and major intercept communications in Australia that the Five Eyes use. So uh, that intelligence is really important, can be brought into cyber, it can be brought into the maritime domain. There are many areas where Australia is contributing real-time intelligence that's very, very important. It also, as I said, has been a really important contributor to the Malabar maritime exercise. And it, while small, has really strong uh, anti-submarine warfare capabilities and maritime domain awareness capabilities. It, too, has received the Poseidon aircraft. And so we're often seeing US, Japanese, Indian um, uh, Poseidons patrolling the whole Indo-Pacific. The last bullet is what I think is really key, and that is we're seeing immense uh, emphasis on co-production, particularly between the US and Australia, in hypersonic missiles. And there's a, a, an agreement that's in place and working very rapidly to provide that capability. Australia has some great ranges where you can look at the capabilities of hypersonic missiles that we don't necessarily have in the United States. But very recently, we've talked about um, US uh, providing, US and UK, providing Australia now with a nuclear submarine capability, namely AUKUS. So just recently announced last year, September 2021. So agreement, Australia, UK, US. This, was, this is pretty revolutionary. The United States and UK have what is called a special relationship goes back again to World War II and the United States providing a nuclear propulsion system for the UK's first nuclear submarine. And the two navies, US, UK, share a very deep relationship and they patrol together and they rotate their engagements and patrols, particularly the submarines. And we, the United States, have helped tremendously in building up their astute class capability. What under this announcement, we're now going to, the US and UK are going to share that nuclear uh, technology with Australia and help them develop their own indigenous capability in Australia and the production eventually of eight uh, nuclear attack submarines. 
And this is really important for Australia. Right now, in, Australia was relying on its um, Collins class, diesel submarines. Diesels are good in certain arenas like shallow water, very hard to detect, but as a long range capability um, out into the areas that it needs to patrol, the diesel does not have the legs to do it. And in fact, when AUKUS came on board, Australia bowed out of an earlier agreement it had with France that was going to supply its newer diesel class submarines. The French were furious, um, particularly with the United States and recalled our ambassador and a lot of brouhaha. Um, this particular diagram just shows you uh, another important aspect of a diesel. It's slower, and because it has to surface, um, it, it is more vulnerable to detection. And so it gives you, in this particular diagram, the length, what we call length of time. It, it can be loitering. So when we're looking at eight, sub, eight uh, class submarines, we're looking probably at the UK astute platform is going to be used versus the US Virginia. It's a much more advanced and more expensive uh, capability. But uh, they're looking at eight submarines, four to be deployed in the Pacific and four to do those important straight monitorings of uh, Chinese activity. An incredible capability, again, um, to bring to the quad. And what's interesting is that India has now been approached by France um, to potentially look at their Barracuda nuclear um, submarine class, upgrade it or keep it to the diesel where they could be um, emerging in this particular area. So lots of capability that the four countries are able to provide. As I said, location, location, location for um, Australia. If you think about the area that indo pacom from all the way from Hawaii, right, Camp Smith, all the way across the Pacific to um, Bahrain. That's a tremendous area that we don't have enough assets to um, provide for that monitoring, whether it's through the Air Force, Army, et cetera. So Australia, by being able to take off the load, particularly in the Indian Ocean, um, is very, very, very helpful. We're going to see uh, increasingly, I think, because of that location, more and more with the development of submarine basing, more interest in using Australia as a naval base, a forward naval base by the United States. And Australia is quite open to this, not only for US naval forces, but eventually for Indian and for UK forces. There's even talk about um, developing hypersonic strike capabilities from Australia that would be mobile, um, very difficult to detect, that could be operated by joint forces. Oops, let me back up. So I think this, this was just from this month, and I, I think it gives you a flavor of Australian thinking, and um, again, the Quad being an important mechanism for how it can counter China keep the United States in play and develop truly um, through the Quad a very robust capability. But with the entry, in, I think, into UK under AUKUS, there's going to be, I think, more and more pressure and interest to bring the United Kingdom and potentially France and expand the Quad into a Quad plus two. Finally, the United States. Uh, this is just released from our, the Indo-Pacific strategy last month, Quad is a foundation upon which to build our Indo-Pacific strategy, Jake Sullivan. The United States views the, views the Quad very differently than the other three partners. It really wants it to be a NATO. It really would like it to be a true defense cooperative alliance, more institutionalized and more structured. Um, and it would like to see it through exercises, through its uh, technology sharing, to be interchangeable, to be more deliberately coordinated. That hasn't, that's met with a lot of resistance, particularly by uh, India, followed by Japan. Australia's coming more uh, in line with the United States view. And there's also been a shift when we think about the Indo-Pacific and how the Quad fits into our Indo-Pacific strategy. So originally, the Trump administration was the first one to enunciate uh, our Indo-Pacific strategy. And the words were free and open, barring on the earlier Japanese viewpoint. 
now under the Biden administration, we're talking about connected. We're talking about prosperous, secure, resilient. So uh, communicating more capacity building. We need to move just beyond free and open to what other benefits can we provide by using the quad as this mechanism. Some of the elements to this strategy from the Biden administration is absolutely to strengthen quad cooperation and recognizing that it just can't simply be that military component. We need to compete with China, China's Belt and Road. So hence, we're talking about infrastructure programs that the Quad is going to provide, infrastructure financing to compete with that Belt and Road. The need for better cyber cooperation, clean energy. So huge push in these different domains. This came out of the 2021 summit. The United States is also recognizing it's, the Quad is somewhat vulnerable because the US sort of sits in the middle of it as a sort of hub and spoke. And what it's trying to do is, is encourage greater inter-quad cooperation, not so reliant on the United States. And the Biden administration, because it's really pushed on, we need more partners, we need more allies, we can't just do this on our own, is, is spending a lot of time on our deepening the five treaty alliances that we already share. And I can speak from SSI, Strategic Studies Institute, where we work with Indo-PACOM, and I work uh, with our army component, um, and tremendous interest on, on the part of the US Army in terms of deepening those partnerships. How can we do it? What are some novel ways that we can um, encourage better relationships with our partners, particularly Australia, South Korea, and India? And I've already talked about you know, a lot more exercises, a lot more interoperability, a lot more interchangeability. I think this is a great example of where the mindset um, of this administration is headed. And it's playing also upon the United Kingdom, for example, when you say we will have more British sailors serving on our naval vessels. He is, Kurt Campbell is hearkening to the fact that this past year, the United Kingdom deployed the Queen Elizabeth uh, Carrier Strike Group through Indo-Pacific. And in fact, it did go through um, the Chinese, the South China Sea in a, on a, fun op, a freedom of operation patrol. And on the QE2 carrier strike group, we had US Marines flying F-35s off the deck. So we're already looking at that interchangeability. And we were looking at it in much more robust ways. And as, as you can see from this, um, how can we do that? As I said, the Indians have been more recalcitrant, but they're, they, through a lot of their basing and their strategic locations, I think we're going to see a lot more um, interoperability than we have ever been able to uh, do before. Advantages of the Quad for us. Um, this is a picture of uh, Prime Minister Modi arriving um, from India on his first visit to the United States with um, President Obama. Uh, that relationship has been a cornerstone of the United States for probably the past decade. We've seen strengthening of that relationship, as I mentioned earlier. We need to engage with India uh, because it is a serious counterweight to China, the largest counterweight to China that we have. Um, and we also need to engage with it's, you know, Australia, and clearly AUKUS is a huge demonstration of that. But part of that is bringing in the United Kingdom more and more increasingly into the Quad because of the naval capacity that the United Kingdom can bring, but also we're even talking now more about military to military, how our armies can cooperate um, in terms of logistics support within the region. Where is China? How is China viewing the Quad? So recent quote, um, from the Chinese foreign minister. Uh, absolutely, they view you know, the Quad as, a, as an Asian NATO. It wasn't always like this. I mean, earlier when the Chinese was able to successfully uh, have Australia remove itself from the Quad, they weren't putting much faith in the Quad's ability to sustain itself. But with the revitalization over the last, uh, you know, since 2017, they've really changed uh, their mind. And so what is their strategy being? 
well, number one, to try and break apart the members. There's been a uh, big attempt over the last two years by uh, Xi Jinping himself to have visits, in-person visits to India and to Japan um, to talk about, one of the aspects would be quad cooperation, on trying to you know, use coercion or incentives with Australia to weaken its relationship with the rest of the quad. Um, but it's gone on an open sort of disinformation and uh, public relations campaign. Whenever the quad meets, Chinese press erupts, you know, protesting. So uh, very little has been in effect because if anything, as I indicate by the last bullet, um, there's growing impetus either to expand the, cap the capacities of the quad in the different domains or to encourage increased members, particularly by UK and France. So what is its future? What are some of the issues that it's going to be faced with? As I mentioned, enlargement. Are we going to have a quad plus two? I think that's likely in the works, particularly France. France is the um, largest European power in the Indo-Pacific. It has the most maritime assets uh, spread out across the Indo-Pacific, partly because of the territories that it occupies within the Indo-Pacific. Here's a picture, as I mentioned, of the UK Carrier Strike Group. Um, so very capable. It routinely. Uh, patrols and does a lot of cooperation, in fact, with India. Um, India is buying its Dassault uh, jet fighter. So it, it's been an important partner. There's always this tension that has to be balanced among the Quad partners of the balance between, you know, are we Pacific focused or are we Indian Ocean focused? Right now, most of the exercises and assets are in the Western Pacific. And the Indians have said, no, our interests are from our uh, west coast all the way to Africa, to the coast of Africa. And that somewhat aligns with the UK. That's where most of uh, Britain's traditional heritage has been. It has bases in Oman, for example, and also Bahrain. So how do we balance that? It can be better balanced if we enlarge it. There's criticism of, is, is the Quad expanding too broadly and getting away from its sort of core security dialogue focus? And are, are they going to is it, is it going to become so unwieldy that it loses its purpose? That's been a question. Another uh, aspect is, uh, can we continue to sustain it with just, at the foreign minister level, you know, four or six meetings a year? Or should we have a better institutional mechanism by which we meet and are able to drill down on our agenda? Big question, particularly coming from the United States. And then, um, you know, is it going to be a, a mini NATO at some point? Uh, particularly if we see an increasing rapprochement with China and Russia over, say, Ukraine. Um, is there more strategic convergence between those two powers that might drive the Quad to look uh, for more established relationships among its four partners? And at the same time, because of China's uh, actions in the Indo-Pacific, the smaller ASEAN powers are looking to the Quad for greater capacity and greater capacity sharing with themselves. So this is an area, too, that the Quad is going to have to think in terms of its overall capacity. So with that, I'll close.